안녕하세요. Riding on the Korean Wave. Welcome to Wednesday's edition of The Culture Wave. I'm Kwon s o w a in Seoul. Explore with us Korea's culture from all aspects and stay up to date with K-entertainment, K-trends, K-performances, K-everything. And uh, we're going to do all of that with our co-host Bella Kim today. Hello, Bella. Hi, s o a And hello, everyone. It's your co-host Bella joining you all again to fill you guys in with K-entertainment news. So stick around for that coming up very soon. And we're also joined by our news features reporter i a n i Hello, i a n i Hello, everyone. Good to see you again, Soa, and nice to meet you, Bella. Hi. <laughs> All right, so i a n i you have some special news about Madang Nori, a performance that is rich in Korean spirit. So first off, what makes Madang Nori unique and a beloved experience? Yes, so, uh, the, so the answer lies in its lively mix of traditional Korean folklore, humor, and audience participation, creating an experience that connects everyone. So now let's take a closer look at what makes this year's 10th anniversary production so special. After a four-year break, the National Theatre of Korea is bringing back its Madang Nori performance. Filled with energy and traditional Korean spirit, Madang Nori is a traditional Korean performance featuring dance, music, and storytelling, which also shares important social messages. The audience isn't just here to watch, they're here to participate. They join in just like actors on stage. Honestly speaking, I believe Madang Nori is one of the most authentic and successful forms of Korean entertainment. The charm of Madang Nori lies in the connection it creates between the stage and the audience in a circular t h e a t e r The Madang Nori performance originated from traditional Korean performance, typically held outdoors in a madang, meaning yard or garden, where the audience actively participates. It was later reinterpreted in 1981 with a modern touch, becoming the vibrant performance it is today. Madang Nori has to be choreographed so that the audience can understand the meaning from all four sides. The dance, music and performance need to communicate the same message to everyone, no matter where they're sitting. The National Theatre of Korea continued the legacy from 2014 to 2020, featuring popular characters like Shim Chong-hee, Chun Yang-hee, and Dol Bu from classic Korean folktales. A blend of satire and humor, the performance offers a clever and entertaining critique of society, making it a genre that can be enjoyed by the whole family, from children to grandparents. In light of the 10th anniversary, this year's production combines the best and most exciting scenes of these beloved stories into one lively, entertaining show. Even more special is the inclusion of the three original Madang Nori stars, who have been performing for 30 years and are honored as living national treasures. The eldest actor Yoon Moon Sik, now 81 years old, reunites with this legendary trio on stage to bring joy and laughter once again. At the press conference held ahead of the show's opening in a few weeks, he expressed his excitement at working with younger talent and hopes that generation will continue to carry on and preserve this tradition for the future. With the talented young performers we have now, you'll see a much more advanced show than ever before. Come and see for yourselves. I'm sure they'll take what we've started and make it even better. I think this will be my last performance, so I leave it in their hands. A 54-show run at the National Theatre of Korea's h a n e l Theatre from November 29th to January 30th, 2025. offers a nostalgic return for longtime fans and a rare opportunity for younger audiences to experience legendary performers live on stage. As the actors say, all it takes is an open heart, just come ready to laugh, clap, and be part of the fun. Uni, I'm not that familiar with Madang Nori, but I, I am with uh, some of the actors that we just saw. Mm -hmm. So just by watching these iconic actors makes me excited about the performance, right? For sure. And all the costumes, that's very mm -hmm. beautiful and shows like the beauty of Korean. That just makes all the foreigners probably get very interested in the show as Definitely. well. Definitely. Mm -hmm. So, Uni, uh, could you tell us a little bit more about the details of the, you said, two-month-long uh, performance schedule? Mm, yeah, of course. So the first performance will be on November 29th with shows every day except for Mondays, but it is also including the weekends. So each two-hour performance starts at 3 p.m. except for Fridays when the shows begin at 7.30 p.m. And the performance will be held at the National Theater of Korea located at the center of Seoul. So as for ticket prices, each one is 70,000 Korean won, which mm. is about 50 US dollars. And it's definitely worth the two hours of excitement. Mm. Mm. The fact that the show is, you know, available for all generations to watch. I want to take my family for, you know, to watch this show probably at the end of this year or maybe next year. Mm. Mm -hmm. 
just to know the show is suitable for audience from elementary school oh. age and off so unfortunately mm. younger children are not allowed but other than that i really hope many people will come and enjoy the performance mm -hmm. uh, elementary school age and up right so i I'm good to go, right? Yes, for I sure. Can go in, right? <laughs> yes, definitely, Bella. Right? Uh, just, just for people who might be confused. I have no <laughs> doubts about that. But thank okay. you for letting us know. <laughs> just making sure. So I'm not really concerned about uh, Bella uh, making an entrance at the performance. <laughs> However, what about foreigners? Foreigners oh, yes. who do not speak the Korean language. Mm. Would that be a big issue for them to attend the performance? So I was also curious about that. So I did ask the production team and they said one of the beauties of Madang Nori is how it naturally encourages the audience to join the performances and become part of the show. So they also said that once they've um, before in the past, they've had many performances overseas. And one time they did this performance in New York and some foreigners came up and said that they've never seen such lively theater performance before. So what they're saying is the energy and the way the audience interacts with the performance itself is um, what makes it possible to understand even without understanding the dialogue. Uh, isn't that's just the beauty of art. Exactly. Mm -hmm. So thank you very much, Inni, for sharing your wonderful coverage. Thank you, Inni. It was my pleasure. Thank you. Time for some K Entertainment news with Bella Kim. Bella, our first story of the day is mm -hmm. about K girl groups making yes. it big on the charts. Yes, for sure. We recently talked a lot about you know K-pop artists on the global music charts. Well, today we're going to be talking about K-pop girl groups and members from girl groups are taking over the U.S. Billboard charts. Uh, first, we're going to talk about the girl group Aespa. Uh, Aespa's new mini album Whiplash debuted at number 50 on the Billboard 200, making it their sixth straight album to enter the charts. They are actually the first K. K-pop girl group in Billboard 200 history to land six albums in the top 50. And they have so far released six albums in total, which means all their albums that they've released have made it onto top 50 of the global uh, of the Billboard 200 charts. That's incredible. Mm -hmm. And uh, if you look at it, another K-pop girl group that we're going to be talking about is uh, Itzy. Itzy also made Billboard 200. Uh, it's his latest mini album, Gold, debuted at number 60 on Billboard 200. Gold is its seventh consecutive album to enter the Billboard 200 charts. Wow! So mm -hmm. it's really great to see these two big K-pop girl groups side yes. by side on the Yep. charts but we also have some efforts by solo members mm -hmm. of a specific girl group right yes blackpink that is uh, first up we're going to talk about the, the numerous we've talked about her numerous times and just on monday as well if you remember blackpink member rose's latest single apathy featuring bruno mars top the billboard global 200 chart for two consecutive weeks now uh, not only that it has stayed strong at number 13 in its second consecutive week on the hot 100 chart as well and speaking of rose another blackpink member jenny also hit the billboard chart as her single mantra secured number seven on the global 200. Mm. Very great achievements here. Now we're mm. going to stay with K-pop girl groups or a specific girl group that actually probably is not really familiar to many yes. of us. Yes, mm -hmm. and that is because they have not debuted yet. Ah. SM Entertainment is gearing up to launch a new girl group. So on Tuesday, uh, they have uh, uh, revealed their upcoming plans, including their goal to debut a new girl group for the first time in five years since ESPA. And as of right now, the new group is set to debut in the first quarter of next year, which is coming up very shortly. SM is known as the Idol Kingdom, especially mm -hmm. with girl groups. They started from the first generation, SES, second generation, girls' generation, followed by the third generation, Red Velvet, and the fourth generation, ESPA. And again, Bella, which generation are we? <laughs> Uh, I want to say fourth, but no. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to go later, maybe fifth. Okay, <laughs> so okay. we're waiting for that fifth generation girl group coming up next year. And with its distinctive musical style, concept, group identity, and world views, SM has crafted successful girl groups that represent K-pop on the global stage. So with that, many, many uh, K-pop fans are waiting 
very anticipating for to see this new girl group mm. from SM. And the reason mm -hmm. why they are anticipating this is because these days already trainees have right. their own fandom. Exactly. So they already communicate with their fans mm -hmm. on social media and that's why we are already seeing uh, many of them counting down exactly. to their debut. And there are some names that's popping up, you know, maybe mm. this trainee is going to debut, this trainee is going right. to debut, but nothing's for sure yet, so nothing has been mentioned. At Just the a number of moment. teasers. Exactly. <laughs> All right, and for our last a story we move mm -hmm. on to a heartfelt story mm -hmm. about an actor that's right uh, actor Pyonusok donated 300 million won that's 217,000 US dollars to Severn's hospital last month to help fund treatment for a pediatric patient he actually kept his donation private as his uh, agency even did not know about this until mm -hmm. later and found out about it for people who are not familiar with Pyonusok he first debuted as a model back in 2010 and kicked off his acting career in 2016 with the TBN drama Dear My Friend. And he recently gained international acclaim for his first lead role as Ryu Seon Jae in TVN's romantic comedy series Lovely Runner earlier this year. Or Seon Jae Opgu Chiyo yeah, in Korean. Son of Chi. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, donation stories, I have to say, are always heartwarming, yes. especially as we uh, approach the end of the year. Right. So let's hope that we're going to have more of these stories as we approach the end of for the year. For sure. <laughs> All right, Bella, thank you for that and stick around. You're welcome. <laughs> and time now to go over to Adi for other culture-related news. Welcome to the Culture Wave AI News. Here are the latest news and events in Korea's cultural scene you won't want to miss. The ill-fated stupa honoring state preceptor Jigwang has been fully restored and re-erected in Wonju, Gangwon-do province, after enduring displacement and damage over the course of a century. Designated as a national treasure in 1962, the stupa was originally built during the Goryeo era in memory of Jigwang Herin who held the highest Buddhist title of state preceptor. It was forcibly taken to Osaka during Japanese colonial rule in 1911 and was shattered upon its return during the Korean War. Wonju City will hold a ceremony to commemorate its restoration next Tuesday. The Torch Observatory, a new landmark in Gangwon's Cheon County, has opened to the public. Constructed at a cost of just over 6.7 million US dollars, the observatory deck was designed as a cultural space harmonizing with the scenic landscape of the Hantanggang River. The torch symbolizes hopes for peaceful reunification. A trial period for public access will run from today until the end of the month, with a daily limit of 480 visitors. Lighting performances, synchronized with music, will entertain visitors on Friday and Saturday nights. The Seoul Tourism Organization has highlighted four convenient spots for enjoying autumn foliage within the city. Hanel Park, Yoido Park, Seoul Forest, and Changgyeonggung Palace. Close to the World Cup Stadium, Hanel Park offers stunning views of silver grass fields. Seoul Forest, with over 420,000 trees from over 100 species, showcases vibrant, uniquely Korean autumn colors. The rear garden of Changyeonggung Palace is also a favorite, featuring a scenic maple line path around the picturesque Chunnangji Pond. And that does it for today. I'll be back with more same time tomorrow. See you then.
This year marks 75 years of diplomatic relations between South Korea and the Philippines. The two countries' friendship has resulted in remarkable economic, cultural and social cooperation. To celebrate the bilateral ties, a number of Korean cultural events are being hosted in the Philippines. So to learn more about these festivities, we now connect to Rhea Buenaventura, PR officer at the Korean Cultural Center in Taguig. Hello, Rhea. Hello, Rhea. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. All right, Rhea, thanks uh, for joining us. First off, please uh, briefly introduce yourself, your center and its activities. Yes, thank you for having us here. So, annyeonghaseyo. My name is Rhea. I'm the public relations officer at the Korean Cultural Center in the Philippines, or we call it KCC. So, the center is actually under the Ministry of Culture, Sports, and Tourism, and we've been here in the Philippines since 2011. We have various events, all for the purpose of spreading K-culture, as well as different cultural and language classes as well. All right, so we're going to talk about those specific events in a bit. But first off, bilateral relations between South Korea and the Philippines were established in 1949. So could you share your thoughts on how the two nations' ties have developed over the past 75 years? Well, we have gone a long way since being war friends. Of course, in terms of bilateral relationship, the Philippines and Korea have gone through multiple partnerships. Um, especially this year, we have actually signed a couple of new projects together. However, in terms of cultural relationship here at KCC, I am a witness of how love the Korean culture is. So it's not just K-pop or K-drama, but even our traditional culture like food, music, hangul, and hanbok experience most especially. You know, and with the love we receive from our audience and the Filipinos personally, I am so proud and happy to be a part of such meaningful organization. Wow, hearing you, uh, the popularity of the K-Wave in the Philippines have grown immensely. And I personally experienced that as well because sometimes I hear Korean news or K-entertainment news from my friends in the Philippines before I you know, read it online. Oh, so wow. I can definitely see the K-Wave in the Philippines. Uh, tell us more about the Hallyu impact over there in the Philippines. So it, like what you said, you know, it started years ago like an annual event, but now it's a weekly one. That's how big it has become from concerts to different actor fan meetings, left and right, back to back. You'll really feel the K-wave here. Well, actually, I started liking K-culture when I was a teenager, and it wasn't even a trend back then. And there were only a few of us who relate among each other. But now it's everywhere, like malls, coffee shops, and of course, like um, stadiums and arenas are all almost all rented out by K events. That's how big it is here. And in the center, actually, um, for our language classes students, one of their top reasons for learning the language is because they want to start watching K dramas without the subtitles. Wow, so it, for you, it must be a really great experience to see this K-Wave uh, spread because you had that own personal experience already as a teenager. Uh, but on the back of that popularity, uh, plus the 75th anniversary of bilateral ties, I can imagine that you have spent a very busy year at the Korean Cultural Center. So, uh, Raya, please introduce us to various events that have been happening this year and also that are still going to take place sure so um first maybe i'll share about our annual event like the korea festival which was actually held in two locations this year it's in manila and cebu and we had our annual korean film festival last september which featured films on friendship we also launched k-drama ost concert featuring the philippine philharmonic orchestra uh, which was definitely a huge success of course our cultural center um partners also with different organizations. So early this year, we had Endless Landscape. It's an interactive digital immersive art exhibition hosted by the National Museum of Korea. And right now, we have an ongoing exhibit in partnership with the National Hangul Museum. So apart from this Korean partners, of course, this year is filled with collaborations um, from our cultural from our local organizations like the National Commission for Culture and the Arts, the Cultural Center of the Philippines, and many more. So as you said, it's a very busy year, but very, very eventful. 
Mm -hmm. Hearing the Korean Film Festival to, you know, K-drama OST uh, concert, it sounds very interesting. But aside from the popularity of the K-Wave in the Philippines, what would you say are some specific reasons or motives behind these events? Well, specifically this year, we really magnified on the theme of friendship because it's 75 years of friendship or diplomatic ties between Korea and the Philippines. So as we celebrate this milestone year, we really want to make it to a point that not only Korean culture is presented, but as well as the Filipino culture in our events. I that's see. great to hear. Mm -hmm. The friendship between mm -hmm. Korea and the Philippines, that's very meaningful. Uh, then I'm now curious how the response was to this event, you know, or which event was, would you say, was most popular among the locals? For our events, we're always grateful for the response and, you know, seeing people leaving uh, our events with happy faces. But in terms of most popular, I would say it's our annual Korea Festival, which was held in May and June. It had a foot traffic of over 67,000 people. And uh, I will also say, apart from Korea Festival, the K-Drama OST concert was a huge hit because minutes after we opened um, the registration for public, we were sold out, wow. actually. Wow, D hundreds of thousands of people wow. attending the festival. Mm -hmm. That is incredible. Now, all of the festivals and programs that you mentioned really seem interesting. I wish I could participate if I get to travel to the <laughs> Philippines. Uh, but do you assess that these events uh, do have contributed to promoting K-culture to the people in the Philippines? Do the visitors feel closer to Korea after attending these festivals? Of course, I think it's one of our goals to make them feel closer to Korea. So the presence of Korean culture is already very strong, as I mentioned earlier, but there are other sides of Korean culture that we are yet to showcase and we are trying to work on like literature, webtoon and Korean beauty. So thankfully, in response to different efforts by the center, many of our participants shared with us that they got to know better Korean culture and that they actually want to visit Korea one. Uh, that is really great to hear. Now, um, last but not least, uh, we would also like to hear of future plans. We're going to also have, of course, the 80th uh, anniversary of diplomatic ties, 90th and 100th uh, so, uh, and so forth. But uh, do you have specific plans for maybe the coming months or next year that you want to share? Yes. Yeah, so. 80 years or 90 years, wow. But for, for this year specifically, we do have quite a few still lined up. We have many exciting events. So in light of the recent Nobel Prize winner, Ms. Han Kang, we're actually setting up a mini Korean pop-up library at one of the main events here in Taguig. We also have Harmony at 75. It's a traditional music concert that showcases young musicians from both countries. So it is our second year to do that this year. And lastly, we are opening a new exhibit here um, in partnership with the National Folk Museum of Korea. It's called Medu, the Korean Nuts. So that's one really exciting also. It is really uh, exciting to hear that apart from uh, the influence of K-pop in the Philippines that you just mentioned, also that K-literature mm. is gradually, I believe, making it uh, bigger in the Philippines. So let's hope that this expands exactly. further to many, many sectors mm -hmm. and more cooperation. So thank you very much, Raya, for introducing us to the Korean Cultural Center in the Philippines and, of course, your efforts in promoting Hallyu in the Philippines. Thank you very much for having us. And that brings us to the end of today's program. Thank you, Bella, as mm -hmm. always. And uh, we'll see you again tomorrow. Yes, I'm always happy to be here. And I'll be here tomorrow as well. All right. And thank you for spending the past half an hour with us on the Culture Wave. And hope you join us again on Thursday at 2 p.m. Korea time and maybe one day here in Korea. Thanks for watching.